our strength, Jesus. We thank you that you came to earth, born as a baby. You grew up in righteousness, living a sinless life, yet feeling everything that we felt. We do not have a high priest who is not empathetic, sympathetic. He understands, he lived it. And Jesus, we thank you for the cross that you died to save us. And thank you for the resurrection that you rose that we might live again. So Jesus, we just remember you, all that you've done for us. We thank you for the birth. Thank you, God, that you sent your only son. We worship you, we love you, in Jesus' name.
Father, thank you this night that we get to gather together and worship you. Lord, we're so thankful for the gift of your son that we get to celebrate. And I pray, Lord, tonight that we would walk away from here changed because of the glimpse we get of the beauty that is your son, the gift to us, to all humanity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat tonight. So good to see each one of you. Excited about this time together. We're going to receive uh, this evening's offering. Our ushers are going to come in just a moment. Every year on Christmas Eve, we receive a Christmas offering in honor of Christ's birth. And and it's, and it's this kind of this kind of thing that that the generosity of God toward us in giving His Son should spark something in us that causes us to say, "We want to give. We want to give to make a difference." Every year when we receive this offering, it goes outside of our walls, of these four walls. We help missionaries that are on the other side of the world that are putting themselves in harm's way at many times to share the love of God and to, and to give the gospel message that is transformational to people that otherwise would not hear it. We also give not only globally but locally to, to those that are ministry partners that are doing work here in this, uh, in this city, in this region. And then I want to tell you about another opportunity that we have this year. Uh, and we've done this things like this before. But uh, just today, a friend of mine called and said, hey, I have a friend that their house burnt down. Maybe you saw last night there was a house in, in the downtown area of Greenwood that burned. And uh, basically, toothbrushes, underwear, clothes, everything. Stuff of value, stuff that maybe wouldn't think of value. Gone. Presents, tree, everything. And I know that they're going to get things together and that's all going to work out. But right now in the interim, well, they have great need. And so we're going to, we're going to help them, I hope, tonight to be able to get them uh, something uh, that will help them in the interim of getting to where they need to be. And so five-year-old daughter, 18-year-old daughter, it's just an opportunity for us to give and give something significant. And so I would just say this tonight. You're here in this place. Maybe you came prepared to give. Maybe you didn't, or maybe you didn't even know there'd be an opportunity to give. I would just say this. Let's think about, pray, consider, what is it that we could give? I would say it even like this. Why don't you just ask the Lord, what is it that he wants you to give over and above what you normally would give to make a difference in the life of a missionary that's, that's pouring his, his life out into others around the world or, or a group of people that are serving here to do outreach into our city? or a family that's in great need. All goes out. We're going to bless others. I'm glad that we get to do that because we're blessed. Anybody blessed, say yes. Anybody blessed, say yes. Some of you may not know you're blessed, but if you're here tonight, you're blessed. You're blessed. You may be facing some stuff financially. It's tough. I'll tell you right now, you're blessed more than most of the people in the, on the planet simply because you're here tonight. And so... Let's pray and ask God's blessing on this as our ushers come to serve you. Father, we thank you tonight for your blessing, for your grace, for your mercy, for the goodness that we experience because of your love for us. And God, we do thank you for your son and that you, you loved us so much that you gave your only son. The greatest gift that could ever be given was your son. The greatest gift that could ever be received is your son. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you'd speak to us. Lord, that we wouldn't be tight-fisted with what you blessed us with, but that we would be open-handed to release so that others can be blessed, that we would be in a position to live out of overflow, out of the excess of the blessing that you've given us so that we can make a difference in other lives. And so, Lord, I pray tonight your blessing on this offering. Lord, that you'd multiply it beyond the point of the need. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. Amen. What's your favorite part of Christmas? Cursing up the Christmas tree. When we get to have all the food. Getting Christmas presents. Getting out of my room, peeking the corner, and seeing where Santa Claus is. What's your least favorite part? Last year, the tree was fake, and we could see right through it. My brother cried because he's scared of 
Santa, but I'm not. What kinds of things do you like to do in the snow? Play in the snow. I like to make snowmen. Make snow angels. Sled down hills. Snowball fights. And then I like to skate, but it's really hard. I can't even do it. Whose birthday is on Christmas? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is. Santa's. I mean, I mean, Jesus. And where was Jesus born? In a tent. In a stable. At a hospital. In Bethlehem. In Oklahoma. What kind of animals were there? Sheep and cows, horses, chickens, camels, pigs, elephants, bunnies and rappers, seagulls, dogs and kitties. Why do other people get presents on Jesus' birthday? Um, because they've been good. Well, they gave presents to him when he was born, and we give gifts to each other. Because Jesus was the gift from God. What do you think is Jesus' favorite part of Christmas? Just seeing people happy. See how everyone's being kind to one another. Probably the missions for all the homeless people. If you could give Jesus a present, what would you give him? A puppy dog. A snowball. A little bear, and he loves it. I'll give him one of my toys. My love. My heart. Everything I had. Why do you think Jesus came to live with us? Because he loves everybody the most. Because he wanted us to be good and not bad. He's God's son, and that was what God wanted him to do. And that way he could fix out all the problems that were happening. He felt like we were more important than him. I think he loves us very much. Why is Christmas so special? Jesus was born on that day. Because you share it with your friends and family. It's a day where we can spend time and we get to give presents to other people. It's about sharing. We get to praise um, Jesus. I love it. Merry Christmas, everybody. That is so sweet. My name is Samantha, and I want to read a Christmas story to all the children this evening. So, little kiddos, I invite you to come on up here on the stage and sit with me. You can come up these steps right here and sit right here in front of me. Not off to the side, but right here in front of me so that you can see the pages of the story. <clears throat> So sit, sit through here. Come, keep coming this way. Keep coming this way. Keep coming this way. So you can see the pages. Yes, more this way. Scoot this way. Let's see. Maybe I can just scoot back for you. Okay. So every year I get to read through several books to try to decide which Christmas story I'm going to read to you guys. And this year I decided to pick my first Christmas story that I received with my family when I was six years old. And I say it's my first Christmas story because that was my first Christmas with my family after I was adopted. So this is my Christmas story I'm going to read to you called The First Christmas. In the village of Nazareth lived young Mary. One night, an angel appeared before her with the light of a thousand stars. Blessed are you, Mary, said the angel Gabriel. You've been chosen to have a special baby, God's only son, baby Jesus. I will do whatever God wants, said Mary. And Mary celebrated the good news. Far away in the east, three wise men prepared for a long journey. We must follow that bright star, said the first wise man. We must seek the newborn king and bring him gifts, said the second wise man. Then, said the third wise man as he was mounting his camel, we shall celebrate the good news. 
In the fields outside of Bethlehem, shepherds watched over their flocks at night. Suddenly, angels appeared. Don't be afraid. We bring good news. Today, a Savior will be born, Christ the Lord. So the shepherds ran to find the baby and celebrate the good news. But in Bethlehem, there was no room at the inn for Mary and Joseph. You can stay in my stable, the innkeeper told them. Right there in the stable, Mary gave birth to her baby. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and lay him in a manger. Mary and Joseph and even the animals celebrated the good news of Jesus' birth. Soon the shepherds came and bowed down before God's son, Jesus. The wise men brought their gifts and they worshiped the newborn king. Everyone celebrated the good news that first Christmas. And now every Christmas we sing like the angels, we give gifts like the wise men, and we celebrate the good news. The end. Thank you, guys. When you head off the stage, make sure you get a gift bag from Miss Carolyn. Excited tonight to speak to you for a few moments. I won't be long, but uh, something important to share tonight that I think is going to impact you tonight and tomorrow and throughout the new year. I thought about, you know, how do you explain Christmas in one word? I was trying to think of the word that I could share just to kind of start this off. And I thought about a lot of words because if we were asked that question, you could think of a lot of words as well. Well, certainly. Festive is a word that describes Christmas. And then I thought about magical. Oh, well, magical, well, that describes Christmas. Whimsical, just the, the children's eyes, how they're filled with expectation. Expectation could be a good word. Peace, well, that's a good scriptural word for Christmas, right? Peace, joy, we just sing about joy, certainly. Great joy, mega joy at this time of year. Love, 
demonstrated at Christmas. That's a good word. But the word I landed on, I think the Holy Spirit just dropped it into, uh, it was like a download from heaven to, to use this word tonight. And it's a word that it doesn't sound as Christmassy as the others that I just mentioned, like hope and joy and love and peace and all those. But it's this word. It's the word intervention. intervention. Christmas is an intervention. It's an intervening God that looked at our situation and said, you know what, something needs to change because they can't get it on their own because we had a problem that we couldn't solve. Every, every human being on this planet has a problem that on their own ability, with their own strength and their own, their own uh, thoughts and, and actions and deeds couldn't do it, and that's a sin problem. We all have a problem with sin. I mean, quite honestly, uh, we, we are uh, many times very self-focused and self-centered and not selfless, selfish sometimes. In fact, you never have to teach a child, a toddler, how to be selfish. They kind of just get it on their own. Like they have the toy. They lay the toy down and go to another toy. Another kid picks up their toy. They drop the toy they got and go back to get the toy that they just lost and say, Mine. It's kind of human nature that we would be that way. There's something divine about us that's different, that we're creating the image of God. And I want to talk a little bit about that tonight. Talk about how that, that, that a God who loved us, well, he intervened in our life. 1942 devotional, Abundant Living by E. Stanley Jones. He was a Methodist doctor, missionary to India. He, he was in, uh, the, in conversations with Gandhi and Gandhi looked at E. Stanley Jones and said, almost as Paul did to King Agrippa, and said, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And he wrote this, and he, he wrote it about, about how the difference of perspective that the early church had about, about what was happening. The early Christians, he said, did not st- say in dismay, look what the world has come to, but in delight. They said, look what has come to to the world. They saw not merely the ruin, but the resource for the reconstruction of that ruin. They saw not merely that sin did abound, but that grace did much more abound. On on that assurance, the pivot of history swung from blank despair, loss of of moral nerve and, and fatalism to faith and confidence that at last sin had met its match. And it met its match in Jesus. In fact, sin was no match for Jesus. Jesus lived a sinless life. The KJV says this, that there was no guile found in his mouth. That Jesus lived a righteous life because he knew we couldn't. And he went to the cross so that we could trust in his righteousness, not our own. The word says this, that our righteousness, our, our, our rightness, our right way of doing things is, is, is just a stench in the nostrils of God. It's like filthy rags doesn't amount to much, are trying to do good because at our best we're still flawed because of the sin problem that we have. And I thought about, as I've been preaching this month, about, well, the cast of Christmas characters. First of all, we know Jesus. He's, no, no Jesus is no Christmas, right? He's the reason for that. I don't mean to be cliche, but let's just be honest. He's the reason for the season. Anybody with me say yes? Yeah. You're okay to talk back to me. You won't scare me. Yeah, he's, he's the reason for the season. But, you know, I like Mary, too. Anybody like Mary? I mean, I think the Protestants don't do justice to Mary. I mean, I'm not, gonna, I'm not, I'm not worshiping Mary, but I also know the Bible says this. She's blessed among women. That the purest vessel that God could find to, for his son to come into the world was Mary. There's so probably a whole lot we can learn from Mary. I mean, she's not where we're going to land tonight. And Joseph. Joseph is a stand-up guy. I mean... When the angel comes to him and appears to him in a dream, he's like, okay, I got it now. I, I, it could have been so embarrassing for Joseph that his wife was pregnant before they were married. It, it could have, quite honestly, been a difficult challenge to say, well, I'm going to care for a son that's not really my son. But Joseph stepped up to the plate and said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do what's honorable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a factor in all of this, all these happenings. Joseph is, a, is one of the characters. Well, the angels, I like the angels. How about you? I mean, I don't want one showing up here right now. It kind of freaked me out a little bit, but I'm just saying. That's why they always say, fear not. That's the first word they say to people because people get freaked out when an angel shows up. 
Sometimes people tell me I've been talking to an angel. I'm like, okay, wait a minute now. Not that you can't, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying. But not only one angel, but a whole host of heavenly angels. I mean, just, just a whole bunch, you know, just I think thousands, could have been millions, show up at Christmas. And the shepherds, anybody like the shepherds? I mean, I would encourage you to read the story. Read, read Luke. Read, read over in Luke chapter 2 about the shepherds. Read it tonight. Read it tomorrow. Read it this Christmas. The shepherds, I mean, they, they were just kind of commonplace guys, just doing their stuff, maybe a little rough. They have an encounter with an angel, and they do what the angel said, and they go and find, they seek out this child, this, this infant king. But the one I want to talk about tonight, not any of those, is, is, is the, I think the most mysterious, the wise men. Wise men are kind of mysterious because they show up in, only in Matthew's gospel, and they show up on the scene, and you don't get any backstory. Nobody tells you about them. Nobody says, okay, here's, here, here's the ABCs on Magi. Nothing. They just show up. Well, maybe there's some stuff in there, but you've got to go Old Testament, but it's there. And, and then the other thing is that star, that star that appears, and Matthew's like, well, everybody will know what this is all about. But I think there's a whole lot that we can, we can glean and we can learn about the star and about the wise men. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 says, Now after Jesus was born, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. And they were saying, Who or where is he who has born, been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. That word worship there is uh, proskuneo, which, which means it's, it's really, it's, it's worship. Some Bibles say homage. That's not a good word. It's worship, and most of the time, it's only reserved for the one true God. It's not just homage to a king, much more than that. And they say, we're here. We're here to do that. We've been following the star, and we're here. And we're looking for, for, he, for the one who was born king of the Jews. And so, and so then Herod, he hears all this, and he does some consultation, takes it all in, vets their story, says, okay, guys, here's the deal. I want you to come back to me when you find him so I can worship him too. And Herod's a little, Herod's a little deceitful and a lot deceitful and evil and all those things. He's one of the, the cast of Christmas as well. It says this in verse uh, 10 of chapter 2. It says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had came to the house, they saw the young child and Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. There's that word again. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. I think it's an interesting story. And it's more than a story for us tonight. I'm going to spend a few moments giving you two takeaways for this Christmas Eve. Two places that I've landed that I want to share with you that I think are takeaways that you'll walk out of here with. I don't want you to just hear some stories and a few words tonight and say, oh, that was good, and check it off that you did your, your Christmas Eve service. There's something that God wants you to walk out of here with that's significant, and I want to share it with you tonight. See, the first thing I think is a takeaway is when it says this. It says, they saw the star and rejoiced. Now, I tell you, I'll be honest with you, I don't think I use the word rejoice today. In fact, there's a whole lot of days I don't use that word rejoice. I mean, I don't know, maybe you used it 10 times a day, but in, in, in most of our vernacular, it's just not there. It's kind of absent. It's kind of an old school word, rejoice. I mean, I don't know. Did, did you wake up this morning and say, well, I just want to rejoice today? Probably not. Probably not. But it's an important word. It's an important word because these wise men, well, they've been, they've been, uh, they've been traveling seven, eight, nine hundred 900 miles. They would traveled to get where they're at. Uh, these magi, and there's a priestly cast, and they 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 made this this trip, and now they had arrived. They they had seen the star. Now I'm I'm gonna be honest with you. In my entire life, I'm not as young as I once was. I've never ever followed a star. I don't know about you. 
I, I would assume, I, I just, I'd venture out and say that most of you haven't followed a star in your life as well. Now, I've seen stars. In fact, every once in a while, they'll tell me about something that's going to be in space, and i got an app on my phone called Sky View, and I'll get it on there, and I'll like look around, and it tells me the name of planets and all that, and I'm kind of interested. When I was young, I had a telescope, and that was kind of interesting. I was in Haiti. We were laying back up on the second story of, of this porch in this building and looked up, and I don't know because it's so dark there and there's not a lot of electricity and electric light or because we're so close to the equator, but it looked like the, the stars here, nothing compared. It looked like there's just... It's just innumerable, as Carl Sagan would say, billions and billions and billions of stars. But I didn't follow any of them. Fact is, I don't even know how to follow a star. I mean, I know there's people on sailing vessels that have followed stars and they use them to guide, and all, but I don't know any of that. I've not followed stars. And, and for these men to be following a star such a great distance, spending money and time to do that, and now they arrive here, and it says this, that the star... There it is again. And they greatly rejoiced. And I think a part of it is this. I think as the songwriter said, they kind of looked at it as a star of wonder. Wonder. I don't know about you, but I don't feel like I have a lot of wonder in my life sometimes. I don't think our world does for sure. I think we can settle into life and we're doing life and we've got all of our rhythms and all of our, all of our um, habits and and the things that we need to do and the things we have to do and the things that are important that we get done and, and all the busyness of life. But wonder, well, wonder can be fleeting and escaping and, and, and maybe it's not present. Now, that's not the same with kids. Kids, well, they're filled with wonder all the time, it seems like. You know how kids are with wonder. My granddaughters, Sophia, Lucia, and Olivia, they can, they can get filled with wonder at a mud puddle. I don't. If it rains, there's a mud puddle. I'm trying to avoid it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm trying to walk around it. If my foot lands in a mud puddle and I splash water all over me and muddy water and my foot is wet, I'm not a happy camper. It's not a good day. But for a kid, my granddaughters, they'll do this. They'll, they'll, they'll get their boots on and all their stuff, and they'll go out after and they'll play. They've they even got a name. They call them different than what I call them mud puddles. They call them muddy puddles. Just sounds more fun that way. Anybody ever heard the term muddy puddles? If your kid watches Peppa Pig, you probably heard of muddy puddles. And they'll get in there and they'll just have a time filled with wonder as something I avoid. They see wonder in muddy puddles. It's like your backyard. My backyard, I have to make sure it's mowed. Other stuff you got to do. It's kind of a workspace, actually. Every once in a while we'll sit out there and have the fire going or we'll, have, we'll grill out or we'll talk. But, but a lot of, I'm, I'm not great at the whole landscaping green thumb kind of thing. And so for me, it feels like, well, it's work to do this stuff. But my granddaughters and your kids, well, they go out in the backyard and it's like adventure land. You ever have a small child come up to you and say, come look at this, look at this, look, and you get there and it's like a ladybug. And I've seen like, I don't know, 10 or 10,000 ladybugs in my lifetime, right? We've seen it. But they're like, oh, look at this. Or fireflies or lightning bugs. I remember when I was a kid catching those. Anybody remember catching those? It's such a cool thing to grab them and put them in a glass jar, put the lid on and punch the holes in it and kind of watch it there by your bed at night. And they all died pretty quickly, but, you know, the wonder died out. But I'm just saying that wonder of catching a firefly. I look at kids in their age. My granddaughter, Lucia, she's four and a half, and she's pretty confident about the half. In fact, she wants you to know I'm not just four. I'm four and a half. Now, I'm telling you, I'll be honest with you, I'm 56. I know you thought I was 36. I'm 56. I'm, I will be 56 till the day I turn 57. There's no 56 and a half, 56 and three quarters. I'm 56, and that's all it is. I'm not rushing this thing. But for a kid, well, they look at adulthood. They look at being an adult. Like, that's going to be that's gonna be freedom, and I'll make my own decisions, and I'm going to do these things and big things, and they have, they have great great wonder at being an adult. Little do they know what we're all doing, living wonderless lives. And they're filled with wonder. And to be a half closer to where they're, they're striving to be, well, that just causes them to, to be filled with wonder. I just would say this tonight, that some of us need to get our wonder back. 
our wonder when we gaze into the, the beauty of what God has provided in his son and we have to step back in all and wonder at what he has done for us. Fyodor Dostoevsky, who was a Russian author, my favorite, and I don't have, I don't like Tolstoy, he's too, too long, and I don't know many others, but, but, but he, he wrote, one of his characters said this in, in one of his books, said, beauty will save the world. Beauty will save the world. And, and you know, we could, we could get around a table and have dialogue and discussion and be really philosophical and trying to say, is that true or not? And I would just say this, here's what I know, ugliness won't save the world. Bitterness won't save the word, world. Evil won't save the world. Beauty, beauty of who Christ is and what God has provided, well, that'll save the world. That'll make a difference in our world. I love the story of Vladimir, who was leader of Russia in, um, in 988 A.D. And in Kiev, Kiev the, the city there, he sent envoys out to go find a religion that he could have for the entire, his entire kingdom. And what he was trying to do is unify. So there are all these different little tribal religions, but there's one religion. So he sent envoys to go look at Islam, envoys to go look at Judaism, envoys to look at Catholicism in Rome, and then envoys is before the, the big schism, envoys to go to uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, uh, to look at the Eastern Orthodox, the, the Catholicism of, of Constantinople. And they went to the uh, and they all returned, and they all came back with, with the research and what they experienced. They began to tell him one by one to explain to them what they found and, and explain those, those different faiths. And when he heard about uh, the envoy that went to Istanbul, to the Hagia Sophia, the, the grand cathedral there, they, they said this. They said, they said, we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth. For surely there is no such splendor or beauty anywhere upon the earth. We cannot describe it to you. Only we know that God dwells there among men and that their service surpasses the worship of all other places. We cannot forget the beauty. And what they were saying was, we beheld beauty. We, we were filled with wonder. Not just wonder at religion. See, that's what I want to tell you tonight. It's not wonder at theology or wonder at doctrine or even wonder at the church, but wonder at the beauty of Christ. Give us the lens to see the beauty of Jesus and what he means for us. Isaac Watts, when he wrote the hymn, he said this, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them through his blood. See from his head, from his hands, from his heat, feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose such a rich crown? Were the whole world in the realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, love so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Isaac Watts got a picture of what had been provided for him, and he said, the wondrous cross, when I gaze into what God has provided, it causes me to step back in wonder. And that's my prayer for you, that you'd be in wonder at what God has provided, that you wouldn't take it as something trite or something for granted, but you would realize that a God loved you so much, you, personally you, that he give his son so that you could know him, so that you could put, spend eternity with him. Second takeaway that I see is this, right? Not only did they rejoice, it was exceedingly rejoicing at the star when they saw it, but when they saw the child, they worshiped. They saw the child and worshiped. I think worship's tossed around so many ways today. And the word I picked up on, the Greek word there, uh, proskuneo, is the idea that, that you realize and acknowledge who you're worshiping. Well, that's important that we do that. And these men, these men were advisors to monarchies, to kings, the Medes, the Persians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans. 
These were the guys that you called in when you didn't, as a king, you didn't know what is the next step you should take. These are the guys when you were contemplating, well, I'm going to make a decision to make this law. Well, you got them around you, and they consulted with you. And, and then once you had their consultation in the, the, the Mede and Persian Empire, once the king made a decree, well, that decree stands. There's no changing. Biblically, we have record of it. Historically, there's record of it, of these, of these magi that would, would, would come around the king and give him direction and in, instruction on how to make a decision. And so, so they're high up on the, on the food chain, I guess you'd say. Uh, when they show up in Jerusalem, well, I, I don't think it's three dudes on a camel, three dudes on three camels. I really don't think that'd do much. It says that Herod was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. Three gifts for sure. My opinion, IMO, might have been 30, 40, could have been 50, maybe 100 magi to show up. They weren't traveling. They, had, they probably had letters like Nehemiah did in the Old Testament, letters that, that gave them access and entrance into, into countries and into prov- provinces of the kingdom where they could flow through without any problems. And no doubt they had a, probably at least a small army with them to protect them. Again, these are, these are people who, although not kings, they are kingmakers. In Persia, you couldn't be king without the stamp of approval from the Magi. So they're kingmakers. No doubt they are decked out in all the regalia, and, and they, they're wealthy. They've got at least got means. They've got resource because they can provide. They didn't stop by the Dollar Tree to pick up some last-minute gift to give to Jesus on Christmas Eve. Right, they had gold. That's a gift you give a king. They had frankincense. That's a gift you give a priest. And they had myrrh. That's, that's a gift that's significant of sacrifice, of death. And they're all costly, and they bring them. And so I, I want you to get that picture because to understand this, that then they worshiped. And the Bible says this, they, they fell down. And some versions say they, they prostrated themselves before Jesus. Now understand this. I don't, know, I don't know if they were on camels. Some scholars say Arabian horses. I don't know. really doesn't matter except when you set up your nativity. Maybe you want to put horses out there. That's cool. However it was, but they, they, they dismount from that and they get down. These, these incredibly important people probably remove some of the trappings of, 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 their, of their, their wealth and of their stature and status, and they probably remove, I mean, I saw the funky-looking wise men in that crayon video. They probably removed those weird hats. And they lay down before a king. Well, that's, that makes sense. They lay down before God in the flesh. Well, that makes sense. And get this. They lay down before a kid. These significant, important people lay down in worship before a child. And I think it's important you understand that they understood that worship to him would cost them their dignity. And I just would say for all of us tonight, get this, that when you really step in, and say, Jesus, I'm following you. I'm in all. I'm all in. No turning back for me. I'm going forward with you. Well, it's important to understand this. You've got to throw off dignity. So many times we have this expression of worship where it's very formalized and, you know, God's way up there somewhere far away and, and I'm going to do my, my religious thing. And I'm just saying this tonight. Maybe that's good intentions. But true worship, authentic worship, means I'm throwing off anything that represents me here and I'm lowering myself. You, you, you understand. Please, please understand this. They were important people, but when they came before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, when they came before Emmanuel, they had to say, we surrender to a higher power and higher authority. We realize that, that we are nothing in his sight and we'll throw off any dignity that we have. For some of you that means this, to just go all in. Right? There may be some tears that flow. There may be some hands that go up. You don't have to do those things. I'm just saying it means this, that I'll throw off dignity. I don't care. You know, I've seen people with their pets. And, and I like dogs a whole lot, by the way. And cats, you know, I have some kind of grace for them, I think. Pray for me. I'm trying to love my enemies. But, but, but here's the thing. I've seen people before, and they'll have their pet, and they're like, their voice changes. And they start, you know, oh, you know, pootsie wootsie, and they do all this stuff. 
I'm telling you, it's silly looking. You may not realize it. it's silly looking. But you know what? You don't care because in that interaction with your pet, you are just so enamored with it. You love it so much that you don't care who is around you or what they're looking at. You just throw off your dignity because. People do it with young children, you know, goo goo, and they're doing all this stuff. You look silly, but you don't care because of the love you have. And I'm just saying this, that real worship, true worship, it is acknowledging who Jesus is, but it's not just that. It's believing, not just that. The devils believe and tremble. It's stepping out and, and saying, you know what, I throw off any of the trappings that try to set me up as somebody, and I come low before Jesus. I surrender my all. The other thing is that, well, it cost us relationally. It cost them. See, they, they understood the protocol of the palace. They understood what it was to be before kings. They understood what it was to interact and have dialogue with kings. They knew that. And they show up with Herod, and Herod's like, and I don't know all the exchange we've got what the Bible gives us. Maybe that's all there was. Maybe there's a little bit more. I, I, I assume they showed up with a gift. I know they gave them to Jesus, but you don't show up to a king in that day empty-handed. And so to get a, have an audience, you're, you're probably going to give some gold there too. I don't know. I'm just reading a little into that. Maybe it didn't happen that way. Here's what I do know. Herod felt close enough to them and felt like they had had a conversation that allowed him to say, hey, let me know when you find the king so I can worship too. And now because they understand government and they understand authority and they understand kings, they've been warned, and they're going to go a different way. They're not going to go back to this relationship, whatever it is, they're going a different way. And I would say this, that sometimes you just got to realize that there's some relationships, they're not healthy for me. They're not healthy in my, in my relationship with God and in my worship to him. And, and understand this, everybody's going to worship someday. Everybody's going to worship someday. You can choose to do it now, or you can choose, Philippians chapter 2 says that, that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. So there's a day when we're all going to worship and it's obligatory. You won't have a choice in it. Right now, the sovereign God of the universe says, I want to draw you in because I want relationship with you. And he's, he's seeking and searching for worshipers. Jesus says it in John chapter 4. The Father is seeking worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth. And so it's this idea that, you know what, I'm going to throw off anything that, that is a barrier to my worship to him. It was a few years ago. I've done many. Don't care to do any more. It was a funeral of a 23-year-old. His mom and dad, they were divorced, but both of them came to me together and said, listen, when you do this funeral, there's going to be a whole lot of his friends come. And I want, I want you to make sure he died. He died fentanyl first time. He'd probably done other drugs, but, and he just died. And here he is. And they told me, we want you to say something because we, want, we don't want to see anybody else do this. And I'll tell you, when you tell me that, like, okay, I'll do it. And I did it. I said, listen, take out your phones right now. It wasn't the first thing I said, but I said, take out your phones. I got mine there. I said, okay, some of you in here, you got suppliers. You got people you're getting stuff from, just like he did. And you need to cut that off right now. The potential of your life, you don't want to see it stopped. You want to, you want to see the potential of your life realized. I said, just, just go ahead and cut those voices out. Cut those people out of your life right now because they're not helpful to you. And I want to tell you that when you go all in for Jesus, sometimes you just got to break off and say, I want him so bad that I'm gonna, not going to allow people to continue to pull me back. Because you know, you know in life there's balcony people. Those are the people that's cheering you on. They're up on the balcony. Yes, you can make it. You can do it. There's also basement people, and those basement people are saying, come on down. They pull on you, pull on you, trying to pull you from the, from the great potential that you have. And I'm saying this tonight. Sometimes worship is going to cost you relationally, but that's okay. There will be another day to do something in that relationship. But right now, pursue Jesus and pursue him in his beauty. Yesterday evening, we were over at the mall. Many of you heard what happened at the mall. Kim and I, my wife, we were in... Von Mar, and we, a couple last minute things, took them up, dropped them off at the gift wrap place, and then we went down and we thought, well, we got a few minutes to wait, so we went out into the mall. We're just walking kind of casually, just thinking about, okay, we're going to go up here. And we just passed Santa, and there's some steps there. And we started to go up, and all of a sudden, 
and I'm a pretty good judge of people. I'll, look, I'll, I'll tell our staff, hey, I think it's how many we had in this service. They count them, but, you know, I'm usually pretty close. I usually see more than they do, but so I may have been seeing more. I mean, I don't know why I'm the only church that has to have honest ushers, but we do. Playing. It looked like 125, 150 people. As a stampede, they were running. They were running right toward us, and they were yelling, run, run, get out of the mall, go. And, you know, I mean, I've never been in a situation like that in the mall, but I knew this isn't good. I turned to Kim. I said, let's go, go. And then there's people. I mean, I'm moving pretty good clip. I passed Santa on his way out, and, and uh, he's old. But, uh, but there's other people, and I was saying, and I was probably one of the biggest guys in this store, and I'm just saying to people, get out, get out, run, go. I don't, I don't even know what's going on, but I'm suspecting. I said, go, get out of here. One guy, I said, go, and he just looked at me. He just walked in the store. He probably thought, that's not very welcoming, right? I was trying to get people out. And then the whole time I'm looking back, and I think, is this some sick prank? Is this, like, is this real? Do I need to go help people somehow? And as I'm moving out, I just keep thinking, I'm in this tension. I want to help people. And I'm thinking, I'm not armed. I don't have my Bible. And I'm just thinking, I don't know what I can do. And it was, it was a struggle because I knew I needed to get out because there was danger, but I also wanted to help people, and I didn't know how to help them. Or maybe you've been there before. Maybe you've had a child sick, and you're getting the stuff you're trying to do, but, but they're sick, and it's not working. And what well, hurts? Because you're in that tension point where you want to help, but then there's nothing you can do. Or maybe it's a loved one in your life, somebody else that maybe it's someone who's suffering from an addiction and you want to help and you keep stepping into it, but but you can't change what they're dealing with. And and it's and it's just a, a horrible dilemma to be in. I think it's the way we've been. Humanity, I would say, is that we want help. And we want to help others. By the way, I said earlier, well, kids can be selfish. Human, the, the, the human innate quality that we have is selfishness. That's not, that's not, that's just the way it is. And so to want to help somebody, well, that's not human. That you were created in the image of God. You know that. You were created in the image of God. You were created in the image of God. And the one thing I see about God is he wanted to help humanity. I think one of the most godlike characteristics of a human is when they want to help somebody else. That's divine. That's a divine spark that he's put in us. But there's those times when we desire, but we can't. And humanity was a wreck. And God sent his son. Not to condemn the world. That's what John, you all know John 3.16, but John 3.17 said he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but th through him the world might be saved. God's is, is in, his feeling, his intention toward you is in anger. It's love. He so loved the world. It's not judgment and condemnation and shame and guilt. That's not what God's doing. God wants to convict you. See, shame and guilt just make you feel bad. You just kind of lay in it. You feel bad. No. God wants to convict you to the point that you realize that I need him so that you can change and have the life that he's prepared for you. You realize that God, the word says this in Jeremiah 29, 11, that God's been thinking thoughts, good thoughts about you, not evil, to give you an expected end, a destiny, a hope, and a future. But it's making that step to step in and let him help because nobody else can really help you like you need. And so just for a moment, if you bow your heads, it's our last service, and I prayed in every one of them. I planned on praying in every one of them. And I'm going to pray here in a few moments. And what I want to do is I just want to find out first if there's some people that I need to pray for. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, when it comes to Jesus and him in my life, I need him, I want him, he's not there. Maybe that's it. Or maybe you say, Pastor, like one man, man did, young man in this first service, after the first service he came to, he raised his hand. We prayed a prayer. He came to me and said, hey, thank you. He said, I, I made a decision to follow Christ when I was in high school. I'd say he's 25, 27. And he said, he said, I'm just not there, and I need to rekindle that relationship. And maybe that's where you're at. 
Maybe you're just in a place where, where there's been a drifting, where you become distant. And what I'm saying is tonight, tonight, on this Christmas Eve night, that relationship can be your reality going forward. And your world will change. So his heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If that's you, you just lift up your hand, lift it up high, hold it up for a moment. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. You say, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you. Thank you on the front row. Pray for me. I need to get in right position, right relationship with Jesus. I'm not there right now, and I need that. If that's you, just hold your hand up. Anyone else? Thank you. See you over here. Before I move any further, is there anybody else? Say, pray for me. Second thing I want to ask is, and just offer to pray, have you lost your wonder? Are you, are you troubled by life more than you are in all of life? Are you moving through life and you just feel like you're busy, 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 and there's no stepping back and saying, taking a deep breath, being amazed at what God is doing. Has life become just kind of a, a mechanical thing and the wonder is not there? And if that's you, if you just hold your hand up. I just want to pray for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being transparent. I believe that tonight God's going God's to renew and restore some wonder. See your hand there in the middle. Thank you. One last, one last the way that I'm going to pray is if you're here tonight, you say, hey, Pastor, I lost somebody this year, and this is my first Christmas without them, a loved one, somebody's important to me. Or maybe it's you lost someone that's been 21 Christmases ago, and it's still so painful. Or maybe you're just facing a situation that's so hard, overwhelming, difficult, maybe it's financial, maybe it's health-related, maybe it's a relationship that's been broken or, or you're hurting, and if that's you, if you just hold your hand up high, I just want to pray for you. Thank you, thank you, so many. I believe God's going to do something tonight in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for those that have just been willing to respond. And, Lord, I know that I saw their hand, but more importantly, you saw it. And, God, you see where they're at. You see what they're dealing with. I pray, Lord, for those that have lost someone. I pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit to be so real in their life during this season. Pray, Holy Spirit, that you visit them in such a way that there is, there is a remembrance of all of the beautiful and happy and wonderful things that they've experienced with them. And Lord, that you just fill the empty spaces of their life. I pray for those, Lord, that are facing maybe a broken relationship or a financial difficulty or health condition. Lord, I pray for your power and your grace to show up that it would be undeniable in their life, Lord, that they would see it and know it and see your hand at work. And God, I ask this in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for those that lifted their hand, just wanting to get in right position, right posture with you as Savior and Lord. In fact, can you do this with me? Can you say this prayer with me tonight? Let's say it strong. Say, Dear Father, I come to you. I'm thankful for your Son and the gift that he is. I pray for your help right now. I turn away from my bad decisions, my hurt, my pain, my sin, and I embrace the future you have for me. I'm changing directions. Instead of running from you, I'm running toward you. And I repent today. Be my Savior and be my Lord. Lead me and I'll follow. Call the shots in my life. Direct me in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe he said that prayer, whether it was for the first time or whether it was for the first time in a long time and you meant it from your heart. God's doing a transformative work in your life. Just allow him to do that. And I would say this, whether it's here or it's somewhere else, get in a Bible-believing church that can help lead you 
There's a lot of good ones. We love it for, for it to be here. Maybe you're a guest of someone, you know, live around here. Maybe you've got a church you can go to. I just encourage you. We won't be having services here tomorrow. We've got an online opportunity that we're, that we're putting out. But first of the year, New Year's Day, we'll be here. And it's a big deal. It's a big deal, I think, because the way I start the year off, many times the way my year goes. And there's something about starting the first day of the year off with God's people in God's presence corporately that just sets the tone for the rest of the year. And what we're doing here at Elevation is we're starting a 100-day journey to victory. 100 days. Seems like a long time. We're going to be in the Word together. We're going to be praying together. We're going to be gathering together. And we're going to watch God do some incredible things because Jesus has already provided the victory. And so many times, so many times, our life and our walk looks like this. We kind of stumble around and we miss it. And we have regrets. We try, to, we try to have a good start and we try to do things to, to get our life in right position or to get our life together. And then, well, after a few weeks, we're back to where we started. And then we just get in the doldrums and the drudgery of life sometimes, regretting and not liking what we've got. Well, I'm just believing that this 100-day journey, 25% of next year is going to be, bring a change to so many people's lives. I encourage you to join with us as we journey, as we make this journey to victory. Victory. I love this part of the service that we're going to do right now, and I invite my family to come. Uh, one of the things that we do every year, and we're not, we're not very liturgical at all, but we like candles, and we like candles in honor of what Christ has provided. He provided light. The Word of God says this, that God is love. It also says God is light. And Jesus is, well, he's the light of the world. There's no other like him. He comes into the world where he brings light. And that light, well, it impacts you. If Christ is in your life, well, there's a, there's a light that's shining brightly. And that light in your life, it's just, you can't hide it. It's undeniable. Undeniable, the light of Jesus in your life. And so I'm going to light our, our ushers' candles, and they're going to come along the end of your row, and they'll light your candles. And just like we share the light of Christ in our lives spiritually, we're going to light the candle of the person next to us. Hold your candle upright and let them lean their candle. Less wax drippage there. And so... second verse. first verse again. Could you lift your candle up? As you do, you might look around the room. 
saying this, I haven't thought it all through, but I've said it every service, and it's this, my prayer, it's been my prayer, is that you'll have health and wealth and a whole lot of Jesus in the new year. And then when you look around at your life, you'll see Jesus and you'll be filled with wonder. That's our prayer for you. We want you to have a prosperous new year, and we want you to have a Merry Christmas. And so for my family to yours, have a very Merry Christmas. blessed and enjoyable holiday evening and tomorrow and however your your uh, Christmas works out this year and keep Jesus as a priority and it'll make a difference in your life. Be blessed. <laughs>